Okay. Hello, everybody. So, I, you know, after seeing the first you know day and a half here, I almost felt bad talking about reinforcement learning and molecular generation again. Um, but I promise you, there there are there are a few uh, a few new things. Uh, buried in here in a new way of looking at, uh, at, at, at this problem. So if you feel like you've seen it all before, you, I promise you the only things in here you haven't. Um, so let me just talk about problem framing here a little bit, especially because molecular generation really means a bunch of different things. I'm really interested in this problem of trying to go from some molecule, molecule that we know already, this is kind of the core of what every steroid looks like, for example, and being able to move into, you know, sort of not too far away molecules, right, and uh, being able to optimize something that we care about. And steroids are one of a large class of things where a whole, whole bunch of related molecules. So this kind of, you know, I will generally be thinking about this in terms of this kind of optimization problem, not as trying to represent the entire distribution of all the chemicals space or one of these things, but how can we sort of effectively navigate through this space? And I'll point out that in some ways this is, you know, not that hard a problem actually to navigate through a chemical space. So a few years ago, several folks, this is one of the one of the interesting things in the space, have said, hey, you know, we're you know we're chemists, we know how to think about navigating chemical space. How do we, you know, start with one molecule and go to another one? And they came up with a bunch of rules, right? And if you look at these, these aren't very surprising. I can add an atom on, I can take one away, I can add, you know, change the bond order from a double bond to a single bond, I can increase the bond order. And they came up with a bunch of rules like this and saying, hey, Hey, this is how you navigate space. Generating molecules is not so hard, right? Start with the molecule and start taking steps, right? And it is a very natural thing to do. And they said, hey, this is how we can do it. You know, we go and we apply all these operations, we apply these operations, and we can go and we can explore chemical space. The problem is that very, very quickly, this becomes completely impossible. Right. This is exponential. You do get exponential growth here very, very quickly. And while this is very, very natural, you cannot possibly find much of anything without some intelligence behind here. And so really, this whole problem of molecular generation, it's not really a problem of how do I generate molecular structures. That's easy. The question is, how do I bias that generation to be focusing on the things that I actually care about, the things that I want to optimize for? And this is, you know, I think that's an important bit when you have the framing in that, in some sense, this is an easy problem. It's only when you talk about focusing the generation that it gets hard. And this is where, you know, this is exactly where reinforcement learning comes up. And, you know, this is, you know, there's a bajillion figures like this scattered around that try to say, what is reinforcement learning doing? And really, so what's going on here? Imagine you're the mouse, you really like to eat cheese, you don't really want to shock, but it's not so bad, but getting eaten by a cat is really, really bad, right? Um, and so the question is not just, you know, it's pretty easy here, the next step, no matter which way the mouse goes, he's going to get some cheese. That's not the hard part. The hard part is to figure out, well, which step is going to help me get somewhere I want to go in the future? Right? And so really, reinforcement learning, a lot of the challenge comes down to this real question of not how good is one step, but how good can it get if I take this step and then get to do things in the future. And it's this estimation of the estimated future value that is really, I think, the key part to thinking about re reinforcement learning and why this is an, why this is an interesting problem framing. Now, you often see, sort of see this back and forth between this, what's the value of me taking this action, or which action should I, could, I can take? And these uh, are in, end up being very complementary ways to, uh, to frame this problem. I have a particular choice here, but they're, 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 you can sort of frame this in, in, in either way and get to very similar kinds of answers. So let me be slightly more formal here in, in talking about how, in, in order to make some of the, the later slides make more sense. So usually in a reinforcement learning scenario, you, are, you assume you're operating this thing called a Markov decision process. And the idea here is you have some set of states. You can be in any one of these states at any time. You have a set of actions. And I take an action in a state, and it brings me to a new state. In general, this, these, uh, this transition from one state to another can be probabilistic. Molecular generation, most of the time, we just treat this as a deterministic thing. You don't try to add an atom and sometimes add something else, though noise can actually be useful for some things. So, but the general formulation would be probabilistic. And then, you, and then the other main part of defining the environment is what's the reward for being in some state? Right? So you've seen all this stuff before. Let me just give you a couple of terms here. We'll talk about a policy, which is just what, what action am I going to take in a given state? In general, this could be probabilistic. Let's just talk about a deterministic here. It's normal to use pi for that. 
And then we have a public, and I want to you know, formalize these concepts I, uh, I mentioned before a little bit. One is the value of being in a given state, and this is a function of the policy. And what I mean by this is, this is not just the reward I'm going to get right now, but some sum over all future time of all the rewards I'm going to get. Right? So that is the value function, so it's a function of the state. Now you may have heard all these things about Q learning and all this stuff and all these funny words and we even call our thing mole DQN, right? And that's because the, 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 the other part of this is a Q function which says the value of taking an action in a given state, not the value of the state, but the value of a particular action. Now the interesting thing is in a deterministic world, these things are very, very closely related because the Q function is just, you can define the Q function in terms of the value function and the value function in terms of the Q function. And so we kind of end up using this terminology in the deterministic world kind of interchangeably and so people will sort of there'll be there'll be a little bit of um, kind of funny terminology as people talk about this the one I, I think it's easier to think about is this value of being in a state um, especially in a, in, a, in, a, in a deterministic world there are good reasons to do Q learning um, in cases where you don't have a good model of the world but that's not going to be the situation that we're in okay so we're really going to think primarily about this this uh, uh, this V pi so how do we do this for molecules? And you've seen bits and pieces of this in, in other talks. I'll, just, I'll give the details of how we actually did this in this case. So the state here is just a state is a molecule. And we're going to talk about there's a set of actions I can do on every state. And this looks very much like the traditional thing we just saw about, uh, which is I can add an atom to, onto my molecule. I can increase a bond order from a single bond uh, on, on up. Or I can go and I can take a bond out. And the only you know, interesting uh, uh, tweaks here is, well, you know, if you remove a bond and it leaves an isolated atom, we just throw it away, right? And we keep, so we always stay at having one connected, one connected component. And really, this is all you need. Now, you can refine this in lots of, in lots of ways. The, all the results I'm going to show here are for this, this action set. But you can make lots of different choices about you know, particular actions you want to allow or adding whole fragments at a time instead of single atoms. Those all fit into this framework. And some will work better than others for particular applications. So this is an illustration of the entire action set I just showed you, showed you starting from this molecule r right here. And all the little yellow uh, highlights are all the things that we're, we're doing to this molecule and taking all these steps. And this is going to illustrate one of the important problems in this, in this whole area is doing this, you very, very quickly get to very large action spaces. We'll come back to this uh, in, uh, in, in a few minutes. But um, this is the type of thing that, that we get to do. Now, this has a natural um, uh, value for doing things this way that you kind of stay nearby where you are. So one of the problems that we, ha that we have throughout um, property models predicting the property of some molecule is it's not clear how it works when I go to a completely different molecule. And so one of the advantages that you actually have with this kind of action space, you actually get to decide what's nearby. Right? By defining your actions, you define what's nearby and you define what's, what's more accessible. And that can be actually be a big benefit for controlling where your model is exploring and controlling how far away it goes. So what do we actually do with this thing? So I talked about this, uh, this, this important value function, this value function as, uh, uh, which is parameterized by the policy. And this is, this is, this is the definition that we, that we uh, typically use. So you have some reward that you get right now. Uh, sorry, this is, the idea is the value is the sum over all future time. Right? So over all the time steps I'm going to take in the future, over the rewards I'm going to get, and then this is some discount factor. The idea is that I would rather get rewards now than waiting infinitely far in the future. And so that's all, that's all, that's all that, this gam that, that, this, that that gamma is. And so this is the definition of what the value function is. Right? Now, uh, you can't actually typically compute this directly, so what do you do? Right? And this is where this thing, temporal difference learning, comes in. So the idea is that I can define this value function in, in terms of the, expe the expected value of my policy of the reward right now plus the value of my next state. And this is the re reason all this, all this stuff works, is that you can decompose it in this way. And then this right here becomes the target of what you want to learn. And so if you have a, you know, at any point in time, you may have a value function, depending on exactly how you're doing this, you can be, you take these steps in the world. And if you iterate this infinitely many times, and you know, you have just a lookup table for your value function, this will converge to the correct answer, you will get to a thing, this is guaranteed to converge. 
what's happened in modern RL is that we don't do this with a giant lookup table. Instead, we, you know, this thing over here, this, this uh, vpy, we're now going to approximate this with a neural network. Now, before I go on, I just want you to realize how weird of a framing this is, right? You've heard a lot about, uh, let's make property models, right? So I'm going to say, you know, give me the polarizability or the binding affinity or something for this molecule. But what I'm asking this model to approximate is not the value of this particular molecule, this particular S, and my state here is a molecule, but the value I could get by modifying this in the future. Right? That's a really, that's a much harder estimation problem. It's like saying, you know, it's not, it's saying, in, if you were to make the analogy to a go position, it's not saying how good is this move right now. It's saying how good will it be when the game is done? Right? And that's essentially what you're trying to estimate here. And so I just want to, you know, before, I think it's important to note how hard of a problem that actually is. Yeah? Does that favor molecules where you have more options in your space? Like, if you you see what I mean? If you, have, if you can do many things, maybe this function will be higher. So, uh, so at the end of the day, um, so this is in terms of some policy, and if you assume your policy is to max is, is a max over the value, right? And so if you and so the normal assumption is that you're finding a policy which is a max over all the values, and so in that sense, it doesn't matter how many actions there are. Now, for the approximation, it might. Right? And so if you move into a state where many, many actions get you, to get you to good molecules, then the estimate that you're producing could certainly believe that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's more evidence that that's a good state than if there's 100 actions and only one of them is good and all of them are terrible. You may end up having more trouble approximating it. And so this is where, theoretically, no, there's no difference. Right? But as you add that approximator, who knows? So. Once you, you know, and so this is the way you do this learning. You take, you take steps um, in the world and you, and you continually update your approximation of the value function in this recursive way, right? That's all that the, that's basically all the learning is. Now there's a few tricks in there about doing ensembles of models and so on, but I think these are actually uh, not that important for the main story. Whoa, this thing clicked a lot. Okay. Um, so, what does this actually look like? So what I'm showing here is for this particular molecule here, and here we are doing one of these, uh, uh, the, these tasks that are, uh, you've seen before. This is actually QED, which is a particular computational property of, uh, of a small molecule. It's a little bit of a boring property, but it's a good, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fine benchmark kind of task. And what this is showing here is this is the kind of relative value that the model believes for taking particular actions. And so these are all of the, the, the atom addition actions. And so you can see like adding this oxygen over here, the model thinks is not very good, so it's very light because it has a low value. Whereas adding this the oxygen over here or extending or, ex or increasing the bond order over here are all considered positive things. And this is the type of stuff that you actually get out, right? And so at the end of the day, you you have a molecule, you look at all of these actions, and then you you know you, you go and say, okay, I'm going to go add the one that looks best. I'm going to add some randomness. I have an exploration strategy, etc. But this is basically what what the reinforcement learning is doing. But it all depends depends on that value function being a, being a good estimate of these expected future rewards. So here's one example of a kind of optimization path that you can go through. So again, this is optimizing QED. And so we're starting up, up here in this corner and then going across. And these are all the steps that the model is taking. And the important thing to notice is this is not just doing a greedy uh, operation. And so you, know, you see up here, these are all just making QED better. But at this point, QED has to get, has to get worse and then much worse before finally making this, this final addition. You can see what's going on. It's essentially going to make another ring, and it takes several steps before before it closes the ring and that makes the QED go up, right? And so this is demonstrating that we can do this approximation. We can start to see this, you know, several steps ahead and not just taking the immediate bonus of uh, making things better right away. Um, so that's, you know, and in, in, uh, in, the, in the, the paper backing this up, we sure show, show more examples of to make this a little bit more quantitative. So the other nice thing you can do here is there's natural ways to do multi-objective optimization. Now, I should say here, people actually mean several different things by multi-objective optimization. I'm going to give the, I will say, the lamest form of multi-objection optimization, which is just that I have a couple of different um, uh, objectives, and I'm going to give you a static weight for them. Very often, what you really want to do in multi-objective optimization is explore the entire Pareto front. 
right? And really understand all the trade-offs, and so you can decide later. But you know, this is a, this is a, and this is a case where we're taking this much simpler version. But as you see multi-objective optimization papers, you should really notice whether you're doing the lame form like this or the really interesting one where you're finding the whole Pareto front. So. What we did here is we took that same QED that we've been talking about here and we added similarity to some starting molecule. So the idea being this is you know, very much analogous to the types of tasks that actually come up when you're doing a lot of optimization, which is you want to stay kind of nearby where you are, but you want to increase some property. And so the reason we did this task is this is very much analogous to what comes up often. And so this first case here, so I'm going to show a bunch of plots that look like this. This is with a weight of zero, meaning I actually don't care about the similarity. I'm, all going to, I'm only going to optimize QED. And so what this plot is showing here is the x-axis here is, simil is similarity to my original molecule. The y-axis is QED. This horizontal line is where I started. And, that, and this horizontal line is exactly the starting molecule. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, what you see, if you tell it not to care about similarity at all, the similarity goes down near, you know, very, very low very quickly, but we improve, we, but we improve QED. But, I, but then we can do a sweep through um, the, the weighting of this space. Um, and so what we see here is that as I increase the weight of the similarity, I start to get molecules which are much, much more similar to, uh, to where I started. And you can kind of find these, these, op these uh, nice looking points where by increasing the weight, I stay pretty close to where I was, but I still get improvements to QED. And if I sort of go to either extreme here, I basically have, have started to ignore improving QED and basically I don't improve it. Right? And, this is, and this is nice because you can also dynamically change this weight after training. Right? This is so you don't have to retrain for every one of these. You can, sort of, you can redo this with, with very minimal extra, uh, with, with, without retraining these things because you have models for these two things separately. And so you know, overall, you can then you know, generate these things saying, OK, what's the distribution of improvements I get? And you can see I get, um, uh, I, you know, I, as I focus more on, imp on, on, improving, on, um, uh, on improving QED, I get that, and then I, and I, I lose the similarity. OK, so I want us to make one note here. So this is a, this is a, a, a figure from, uh, from our paper, and you've seen other things talking about this log P. Um, and so you know, this is probably not, you've seen versions of this particular chart before saying, hey, look, look how much better my log P value got uh, as a result of doing this, and it's way better than kind of simpler things you would do. But there's a really important thing on this chart, which is this line right here. This is greedy. Right? This is, I'm going to take the next action which improves log P as much as possible. I'm going to forget about the future. I'm going to be totally, you know, totally myopic. If you just take greedy steps, you can be basically as good as everything else. Right? And the reason is log P is a really dumb property. Right? And you saw, the, you saw these kind of things before where you, just, you can make log P better by just starting attacking on carbon atoms. So my real hope here is that if I accomplish anything in this talk and nobody ever uses log P again for these molecular optimization papers, we, I will consider this a success. Right? So it's a fine place to start, but you realize there's kind of this dumb way to, um, to get at it. And the fact that greedy is really good means this is just not a very good benchmark task. So please stop. OK. Uh, <laughs> so I, I talked about this before. Um, that, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so log P, people are interested in that because of, interestingly in drug design, because there was a belief in the past that uh, uh, drugs uh, diffuse through the membranes. Of, and that's almost certainly not true. You know, there are special transport proteins right. which, uh, so log P is very strict. So I, I actually don't, I don't want to say log P is pointless. Um, I actually think log P will identify some molecules that will have problems, right? But using it as an optimization objective without, not in the presence of competing things, right? It just doesn't help you, right? Because there's sort of, it's like there's a really easy way to get that objective, right? And so it's, I actually think it's still probably, a, it's still a useful property to throw through to, um, to, to, to throw out some kinds of molecules, but you can't do it just as a plain optimization task. Yeah, but then in reality, there's probably a thousand different transport proteins which yeah. well, are really important. Yeah, and so whether log P is actually even that important and whether we should be having the, you know, the rules of thumb that people have along P, I actually, yeah, I mean, that may be false also. Yeah? Uh, let's put 
property to optimize them? Um, so I, the uh, the one that I think is the most interesting and so and uh, to do is you need ones that have really really complicated energy landscapes and some of the best small molecule complicated energy landscapes I know of are when you start to look at things like docking and FEP, et cetera. And the interesting thing is, actually it doesn't matter if they're right, they're just, but you know that they're complicated, right? And that's actually enough, right, for it to be an interesting optimization task. So I think those kinds of tasks are actually some of the, the best that I know, rather than these, you know, the thing is log P is, you know, computed in a couple lines of code. You end up, you know, you end up getting a model that very quickly does that. Understanding the, the, the optimization landscape for uh, some kind of uh, intermolecular uh, contact and energy, I think is, uh, that's the kind of task I think is much more interesting to do. And maybe it would be an interesting thing to do um, as part of this to try to really design a much better benchmark for this, so. Maybe uh, as a suggestion, since this is a machine learning meeting physics, a good property to start with would be the energy itself. Yep. Um, and then all this optimization would be to find minima of the energy. Yeah, we gotta be careful there because there's kind of obvious things to do of just like one atom is probably has the smallest atomization energy, right? And so there we gotta we gotta we gotta make sure we design it in a way that it doesn't have these sort of obvious you know failures. So I, it'd be a good thing for us to try to figure out. So I think I actually think you know I'll leave this as a challenge here. Coming up with really good benchmark tasks would actually be a great thing to come out of this program. So. So here's the big downside with this kind of method is. Taking a step can actually be quite expensive, and especially if you go a little bit further and expand the action space at all. In order to take a step, you enumerate everything you could do, you construct that molecule, and then you run that through your value function and then decide what to do next. And this can actually be a fairly um, uh, complex thing to do, especially if you start to get bigger and bigger molecules, because in that simple action space I showed you, we, look, we add an atom onto every single possible point of the molecule, and that can get to be a lot of points right away. Now, there are some other methods that are these policy-based rather than a value-based that has some, um, that, uh, that uh, uh, do some further approximations to, uh, uh, to, make this, uh, to make this work. But this is one of the ongoing problems with this, especially if you, as you want to inject more stuff in it. So, um, yeah. So, so in Chile, when you're building you know, all your tree algorithms, have similar problems, right? So like ground forests and creative just trees and stuff. I mean, it's like a different problem, but a lot of times you, you, that you constrain the space of choices. Right. Like at each step. Is yep. that helpful at all here, or does it just lead you to bad places? So, I mean, we, this is now, there is so the question, you know, how can we constrain the space to deal with this? And this is something we've actually have done since then, and look at things like, well, do we really want to allow you to increase bond order inside of a ring? Right? Or do you need to have an action to increase the bond from single to triple? Or can we just say, oh, single to double only? And then if you want to get to triple, it's now two steps away. Right? And so you can kind of do some shaping of the space like this, which is actually helpful. And, yeah, and you can be a little bit clever. Like you can imagine just doing like thinking of random force or something. You just pick like a random subset and just pick one uh, You could look at random subsets. And you know, on average, you would probably get to the right thing. I haven't played with that idea at all. So. So now, so if you had heard any of this, you probably had seen um, seen some of this before. This is now an analysis that I have not seen anywhere. Um, so let's remember that we're doing this really, really complicated thing where we have to we're trying to estimate this value of a molecule as all of the rewards I could get in the future. And so this is a hard estimation task. And we can show that the, using the value function, we can get somewhere better. But do we actually, we never actually evaluated whether this approximation was good. And no, almost nobody does this, right? Nobody goes through and says, how, you know, how do I know if my approximation is any good? And so what I'm going to show you is a, a bit of work trying to evaluate how good our approximation is. And so here's, here's what we did. We have a couple of toy versions of this. So this one, we're going to start with an empty molecule. We're going to do the same QED property. And we're going to go up to 10 steps. Now, why are we only doing 10 steps? Because fortunately, that only generates about 6.8 million molecules. 6.8 million is kind of not much. Um, so you can afford to just run everything on all of those and actually compute the true value function for every single one of those 6.8 million molecules. 
right? So you can actually decide how good are all of those molecules um, per exactly, and then and so you have a giant lookup table for it, and then you can see how good is my approximation. So. Um, so we did this, and then we trained a uh, we trained a model. One thing I'll point out here that's maybe also not obvious: we only we saw less than 100k molecules out of the 6.8 during the training, and so there is some real generalization that has to happen here. So. First of all, just you know, I'm talking about optimizing QED in order to have an idea of what we're talking about. These are all. This is a distribution of all of the values of QED that are accessible in that 6.8 million. And so you can see, you know, right up in that, you know, but the the, the top one I think is in that 0.689 somewhere in there. Um, and the range is, you know, in that 0.1, uh, uh, 0.1 to 0.7 ish range. Um, so how do we do? So this is showing for the after the model learns. Taking, its, taking what it believes the best steps are to optimize QED. And so on the y-axis is QED. This is the range I showed you earlier in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the dashed lines. And then this is the actual value of the molecule given that the, given that the model took a step. So here, it, you know, the, the best value before you take any step is clearly the max. You can see on the very first step, the model actually makes a slight mistake. So it actually gets to a point where it can no longer make the quite optimal molecule. But from then on, it manages, it, it sort of stays on the true path, the best that it could do from that point on. Right? So in some sense, this isn't too surprising. What did it mess up? It messed up the hardest thing to estimate, which is, you know, the thing furthest away from your goal. Right? So but on the other hand, it also did it also did quite well, and it got to I forget you know it's like 99.9 .9 something percentile of the best. Um, now, that was actually partially that was only part of the story. So this is what actually is going on inside of here is we're training a whole ensemble of models. So we have a whole bunch of estimates of the value function, and we use all of them during training. And it turns out that one of those 10 estimates we did was got very confused. So we were trained 10 simultaneous models. Nine of them looked essentially identical to this. And one of them got confused and, made, and makes an error on step two here. And then a few more errors, a few more errors, and finally it settles down, right? So, most, so the answer is mostly, we, mostly it does a really good job on this optimal path, but you do find these particular failure cases. And depending on how you were actually running this, you might have fallen into this case. Yeah? Uh, is this the kind of approximate model, right? So this is the true value uh, of, you know, given that the model took the step that it thought was best, right? And so the true value at this point, uh, it could have still gotten, what but- What is the model? The model is the policy or is it the- The model is, the model is this, is the estimating this value function. So there's a true value function, which we're able to actually calculate, and then there's the estimated value function. And so these are the steps from the estimated value function. Um, so, Here's another way to look at this. So this is the this is showing the true value of the action of a, of a um, so let me just sorry let me, let me frame this right. So this is on the path that the model thinks is best at the end of the day, but that's not everything you might want. You mean you want to know whether the model's any good when you step away from that path, right? And so this is now taking a whole bunch of random molecules in the space, not just starting from the empty one. But for a random molecule, if I say, what's the true value of the action that the model thinks is best? And then this is what, this is the, um, the true value of the actual best action. And so if the model was perfect, this would be a y equals x line. It mostly is. I did the, the sort of, I did this hex spin uh, plot rather than a scatter plot, so, but uh, this is basically a straight line, except a little bit, there's a little bit of uh, weight over here, meaning that the model is undervaluing, um, uh, undervaluing some of the actions. Um, and if you actually now want to look at that in a, in a slightly different way, this is you know, how close to the true value is the estimated value. And we do get a little bit of spread here, right? And this is interesting that, you know, if you look at for a particular action, you get, you know, the range for one action about how different the true values could be is in that like 0.1 range. And you can see we get errors which are quite significant relative to that. And so this is actually kind of funny that the model, you know, quantitatively, it, it has a lot of its estimates wrong, but it gets the ranking approximately correct. And that's kind of the moral of what we're able to find through this is that where the ranking is better than the absolute values, even for this really, really toy problem. 
Let me show you one other um, example like this, which is a, a little bit more of an interesting case. So this is vanillin, uh, which is a nice little tasty molecule. Um, and here, um, because the, the space gets very big fast, we're, I'm only going to go up to six steps. This gets me to 26 million molecules, and we see about 145K during training. So similar things that we showed before. Um, so very similar, a little, you know, similar distribution of QED, except the maximum is a little bit higher, um, as well as you know, this sort of the whole mass goes a little to the right. And here we see that in this case, in this case, the model is essentially able to do essentially optimal, right? Now the interesting thing is, until the very last step, right, it's the model can basically always recover. So these are all the possible actions the model could take. And even at step five, you know, the worst action it could take was still at you know 0.8 something. Right? And so this is actually kind of an interesting statement about the space, right? That it's very easy to recover from a lot of mistakes in this space. Right? You take a bad step, you can recover by taking a different step. Right? And this is sort of this is sort of reflecting something about the complexity of this uh, of this domain. The other thing that I think is interesting about this particular case, if we look at this guy over here, this is the actual minus the estimated value. Um, wait, did I get I, I hope I got my sign right. Uh, I may have my sign backwards. The estimated values are too low, um, is what we see. So the model can it much more often is underestimating the true value of the true value in this particular case. Yeah. So were there trends here you saw in the, uh, the discount rate? Uh, uh, so in in doing this, we have no discount because we have a fixed time horizon. We just treat we we the only reward we get is at the last step, and so we're doing this with no discount, only rewards at the last step, no intermediate rewards. That makes a bunch of the it makes the the Q value easier to understand and actually reflects what you care about. You don't care if you made five nice molecules and then made a great one, or made five terrible ones and then made a great one. Um, so we put all the reward at the end. Do you have the option to make to take no action? So that if you arrive at a great molecule halfway in your horizon, that you can keep it. We've uh, uh, generally yes. I actually don't know for this exact run if we took the, if we put the no action action in there or not. But I, but in general, we've run with it. So yeah, that's a perfectly valid valid thing to do in general. Okay. So this is all this, uh, this system we call uh, mold DQN. That's deep Q network. That's what the DQN is for. Um, and you know, uh, a couple of the key things to remember, this is a value function based reinforcement learner. There are also policy based reinforcement learners. This is a value function based. Um, it can be expensive because of that, because of this enumeration of all, all, all the, the valid actions. Um, we've shown it, it works well for doing optimization for fairly simple tasks. And we are now using the, you know, using variants of this algorithm in real lead optimization programs in drug discovery. And so that is, as I said, this, that's the kind of framing that we were, that we were really interested in. So um, let me make a, a, little, a, a little interlude here um, before I give you, I'm gonna spend a couple minutes on one, on one more thing. So we've heard a lot about smiles versus graph representations, and I will tell you that I am not a fan of using smiles representations as a way to do learning, right? And so these are examples of smile strings over here, um, and uh, the, and you know, if, even if you don't much chemistry, you can kind of see things, you can guess the equal sign represents a double bond, because that's what it looks like in the graph, right? But here's one of the reasons I hate smile strings, all of those things over there are all vanillin. Those are all perfectly valid representations of the same molecule, right? That should bother you, that should bother you a little bit, especially when these things look quite different. But even more than that, as, we, as alluded to earlier, there's this annoying syntax here. So this is one of the, um, for this particular molecule here, it turns out these two guys right here, these are actually these atoms right here that have a bond between them. Right? And it, it seems to me that we are just making our life too hard if we are asking our models to learn enough about the syntax to then go back and reconstruction, reconstruct that these two guys are connected in the same way that these two guys are connected. So I am a big, you know, now I want to say people have done some good stuff with smiles and there's been a bunch, there actually have been effective for a number of things, but it, yeah, I really believe there's going to be a wall of how far you can get. And so personally, I'm only focusing on these graph based representations. Yeah. Sure. But also, <coughs> it's a curse, but also a blessing. It's a free data augmentation. And actually, <laughs> <laughs> actually, it was immensely helpful because data set is small. And then you multiply it you know, 1,000 times for free. 
But, but it's not really multiplying the data set 100 times in the same way that you take an image and you rotate and flip it, right? I agree, data augmentation is useful, but here it's because we are just, we have these arbitrary ordering choices that we have to make in smile strings and we're forcing our model to learn how to deal with it. Yes, it's gonna help if we can, if we to teach our models to deal with it, but it's not, I mean, in some sense, it's not really adding new data, it's just helping the model learn in the same way that we might teach a child that you can construct a sentence several different ways and they all mean the same thing. It's an important thing to learn, but you, you haven't enabled them to say anything else. So, but like, tomorrow I talk about selfies, which are 100% yeah. body strength. Would that also be on your least cost, or do you think that? No, it's not, it's not even all validity. You're still going to have these long range correlation kinds of problems. Um, there, you, I, and there's, no, there's sort of no way to linearize and not have long range correlation issues um, in particular. And you're still going to have some kind of canonicalization problem. So I don't think, you know, I, I, from what I've seen of selfies, I think it's a better representation than smiles because you deal with, you know, you, don't have, you have a lot less validity problems. But I think you're still going to have these two issues. I mean, it's just not a linear structure. Yep. So it's just not the right topology or one thing. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, that was my rant about smile strings. Um, so, um, so we've heard a lot about autoencoders. So I'm now going to I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and tell you about a combination of reinforcement learning and autoencoders, but in a, a somewhat different way than we've heard about. Um, uh, let me. So let me just. Uh, so big picture for the auto autoencoder, right? We, have, we build an encoder, it goes down to some small latent space, and we build a decoder and hopefully recreate what we started with. Um, you've heard a lot, about these, uh, a lot about these things already, so I'm not gonna go into details here. But the general problem in these graph-based structures are we understand how to make these encoders, right? This, for, there, we've talked a lot about graph-based networks. You've heard several examples of how to do this. That's not the problem. The problem is always how do I make this decoder? How do I make a decoder that's able to make valid molecules, that's, uh, that, that is, obeys all these chemical rules, et cetera? Well, I just spent the first chunk of the talk talking about a process for making molecules that obeys validity and actually works really well. So the answer here is, let's use all that stuff I told you about already and use that for the decoding. So this is, this is clear, I wanna be clear about something. So the idea is, have a BAE, your graph encoder is the same thing we normally do, a simple graph network, but the decoding is a policy for an RL agent. So we're not using RL for optimization, we're just using RL to construct a molecule. So the idea is, the, the, the only important difference in all of this is instead of just having a single value function estimate, I get to put in the embedding, the latent space representation that came in from the encoder, I put that into my value function or my action policy, however you wanna, however you wanna think about it, and use that to do the decoding. So let me give you the details here. Um, so here I'm going to talk, you know, what we're going to be trying to estimate is this value function, just like we had a value function before. This is the value function here. And the things we put into this are um, uh, an embedding of the, of the current molecule. This is our state, right? This is where we are, the molecule we've created thus far. An embedding of the molecule we're trying to get to. Right, so this is saying where you're headed. So this is where you are, where you're headed. And then these two versions of T are just representations of how far along you are in the process. You can kind of ignore these if you ignore these for the purposes. These are the interesting parts of the parts of the function. So you know where you are and you know where you're going, and that is the parameterization for the value function over here. After that, it looks like it looks like everything else I talked about. You go through an optimization process, you try to build better and better estimates of these molecules. So um, uh, the key thing is now about the rewards. I told you about the value function. For the value function to be defined, you have to have a reward. And basically, we, we assign a reward by whether you look like the molecule you're aiming for. And fortunately, our cheminformatics friends have a lot of definitions of what it means to be like another molecule. So we basically took the kitchen sink of, sim of similarity methods, threw them all in. And the beauty of doing this with the reinforcement learning agent is none of these things are differentiable. Right, but because I'm using temporal difference learning where I'm building an approximation to the value function, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that none of these are differentiable. I calculate these things and I give the reward that way. Now, if you, uh, there's a reason somebody in the audience may be very suspicious about everything I've said. Um, and so I'm gonna try to anticipate your suspicious here, which it really looks like I cheated, right? I'm giving reward 
based on the decoded molecule, what I want you to get to. But in general, you're not going to know what that is, right? All I've got is this random embedding, this latent space point, and say, I don't know what that molecule is. The reason this doesn't matter, you only need the reward during training. Right, so this is like you know you teach your dog to do some tricks and you give them a, and you give them a, a a treat every time they do the trick. Then when they perform, you just don't give them the treat anymore. They're still going to do the trick, right? They may not do it for long. Eventually they'll get mad at you because they, they're still learning. But after they've learned, you don't have to give the rewards anymore. The value function you can use the value function still to do this. And so all I need is any point in the latent space. That's this guy right here. This is my latent space target. I can pick any point and whether or not I know what molecule it corresponds to, and I run it through and I see what comes out. So it's not cheating. Um, so does this, does this actually work? Um, so this is, I'm only going to give you a couple measures of whether it actually works. So these are a couple of different um, uh, autoencoders. You've heard a little bit about it, uh, the, this junction tree variation autoencoder and the grammar variation autoencoder. And this is one measure of are we able to reconstruct um, molecules accurately? And we do okay. This is actually not as good as it probably should be, but um, this is another way of, of looking at this is when the molecule, when we don't manage to reconstruct the right molecule, how far away are we? And so you can see most of the time, this is a log scale over here, we are zero edit steps away, meaning we are zero steps away, we've gotten the correct molecule. You know, a very small fraction of the time that we've got, we got right next to it and didn't take the final step, which would be a very sad thing to happen. And then, you know, most of the time we're just a couple of steps away. Um, for the ones that we, for the ones that we don't make, this is you know maybe about half the time that we don't make it, we're only we're only a couple of steps away. So this is where you know it seemed like we got close to the correct estimate, but we weren't really able to get as far as far as we needed. Um, I'm going to skip that guy. Um, so. Uh, so I think this, I think the RLBA is a really interesting method for doing this that allows you to impose, to first of all, get 100% chemical validity, impose any arbitrary set of constraints you want, and, um, and, and still be able to do some of the nice tricks that you can do with variational autoencoders. So I showed you these, I showed you these two methods of how to use re reinforcement learning um, during this generation process, and I'd be happy to take any questions.